This weekend, we're going to talk about putting it together again when it's all fallen apart. Because the truth is, we live in a world where things fall apart. It's called a fallen world, and so things fall apart in this world. We also have a God who's in the business of putting things back together again, both here on this earth and all the way into eternity. Both of those things are true. Yes, things fall apart, and yes, God's in the business of putting things back together again. So we're going to talk about what do you do when it's all falling apart. And if it's not all falling apart for you right now, just wait a little while and it will be. So you're going to need this message pretty soon because it just happens in life. And the truth of the matter is, if it's not happening for you right now, you have a friend, you have somebody in your family that needs this message. You need to listen to it and pass it along to them. So God's put, since God's put you in a place of strength where you can share it with somebody else. When you think about what it means to, to fall apart, there's lots of things that fall apart in life. A couple verses at the top of your outline. Sometimes we're the ones that are falling apart. It's happening inside of us. You're falling apart. No one else may even know about it, but you'd say, yeah, I am falling apart right now. The Bible talks about that. Psalm 119, 107 in the message paraphrase says, everything's falling apart on me, God. Put me together again with your word. God's promises, God's word has the power to put us together again. Sometimes we're falling apart. Sometimes, uh, sometimes our relationships are falling apart. The Bible says in the book of Luke 117 that God will bring fathers and children together again. I have no doubt that there's some dads here who your relationship with one of your kids, it's fallen apart. You'd like to put it together again. All kinds of relationships fall apart. Marriages fall apart. Moms and daughters and sons fall apart. Friendships fall apart. God wants to put those relationships back together again. He has the power to do that. Sometimes <clears throat> it's just stuff that falls apart in our lives, like a business that falls apart or a ministry that falls apart. Or sometimes it's very practical, very real. You find yourself in the midst of a natural disaster where because of a fire or a flood, literally the, the house that you had, it's fallen apart. Or the city that you were in, it has fallen apart. That's what happened to my wife Shondell and I. Many years ago, we had a flood destroy a town that we were in, and it all fell apart. And God gave us a promise during that time that we've held on to in the years since for <clears throat> all kinds of falling apart situations. It's the next verse in your outline. The Bible says, Nehemiah 2.20, the God of heaven will help us succeed. We, his servants, will start rebuilding and what is it for you? For them, it was a wall. In Nehemiah's day, they had to rebuild the wall around the city. What is it for you that needs to be rebuilt in your life? Well, I want to tell you a little bit of the story of what happened to us, because it's really what, what I'm going to talk about today is, is based on. And it's not just my story. It's also Shondell's story. She happens to be here. So if you don't mind, I'd like to bring her out for just a minute to help tell this story. <laughs> Hello, beautiful. <laughs> On February 20th, 1986, a levee broke near our home, um, which at the time was in Marysville, California, up above uh, Sacramento, north of Sacramento. Um, I cleaned house all day uh, to prepare for a women's ministry meeting that was going to be at our house that night. And Tom, being the wonderful husband that he is, said, let's go to some fine dining establishment. Charles Jr. <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> really fine. And <laughs> figure, um, you know, so that we can keep the house clean. So um, we did go to Carl's Jr.'s, and we should have known that it was, uh, something was up when it was pretty empty. Um, I was busy uh, taking care of our son, Ryan, that was 16 months old at the time. And uh, Tom said, shh, shh, listen. And we overheard on somebody else's radio that the um, levee had broken and that our whole area was being evacuated. And they said, oh, you don't need to worry. We don't, you know. And I said, we live there. And so, you know, I wanted to go right back home, but um, there was a bridge between us and our home. And so we couldn't. And my first thought was, oh, well, we need to tell the women that we're not having the meeting. And Tom said, they'll figure it out. <laughs> and so, so literally all we had left were the clothes on our back and the car we were driving. And we... We drove our Chevy to the levee, and the levee was dry. I mean, that was us. The song is about, about us. It, it doesn't apply. The levee was very, very wet. <laughs> All right. But anyway, All right. we turned the other direction and went to a church member's home um, and asked if we could spend the night, and we ended up staying a week. Then we... Um, we would anxiously watch the news for a glimpse or maybe, you know, hoping or dreading for a glimpse of our neighborhood. And um, sure enough, in a couple of days, we found um, the 
the, on the front page of the paper was a picture of our home, which we figured out was our next door neighbors, and the water was to the roof line. So I was, uh, I was digitizing some old VCR tapes. Remember VCR? A couple, uh, couple months back. And found some news footage that people had sent us. So here's a couple clips up on the screen of what, what happened. The water was to nine feet um, at our home. Um, it, the air pockets kept it off the ceiling, so we got to save the ceilings and the roof. Um, but we made lots of trips in by boat. Uh, trying to wade in waters that was very cold, you know, above our waist, to try and pull out things like computers <laughs> and um, salvage what we could. And then they began to pump the water out. So we had to, the first job was to, you know, get all the junk that has, was ruined out of our house. And our, our street looked like a war zone. There were literally 20 foot high piles in front of everybody's house of all the, the, the destroyed possessions and stuff. And then we had to gut the house and take everything out of it um, and uh, then rebuild. Hmm. It was hard time. It was, it was a hard time. I had a um, home-based bookkeeping service, and um, Tom, our church was also involved because it was half a mile from our house, and just, the buildings were destroyed, so we couldn't meet in them anymore. And so every area of our life was affected. It, um, it was a huge financial loss because we didn't have flood insurance. We didn't know that you had to have separate flood insurance, and nobody around us had that. My first grief was the fact that we weren't home um, when, we, when it happened, so we weren't able to gather any irreplaceable things. Tom was really wise and comforting, and he said um, we were all together, which was really important, and that he wouldn't have allowed me to stay, take time to pack anyway, because even then I was not a fast packer. And, <laughs> um, and the, the thing was that we had our precious um, baby boy, and he was much more important than his baby pictures. So we started to rebuild church and home. In our, in our home, it was months and months and months we were out and, and rebuilding. And uh, finally, when we got some subfloor down and had water, at least in the bathtub, we, uh, we moved back in. People were surprised that our church continued to meet. Well, how, how could you have a church without a building? <laughs> Saddleback has, that's for sure. That's how we grew. <laughs> we, we already knew the example of Saddleback, and we go, this is not a problem. We, we can do this. And we began to meet with, um, together with a fairly small group of people and in homes and then in our local community college. And it was a precious time. It was a very, very difficult time. Several other, other of our members had damage to their homes. And we, but we joined together in that verse that Tom read, the God of heaven will give us success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding was just an amazing verse for us. And um, a year later, we bought um, property for the church near the freeway and built a new worship center. And it was, it was an exciting time, even though it was a really, really hard time. What did we learn through all of this? God taught us so, so much. That's why Tom wrote the book. <laughs> You know, I've been thinking for 30 years about how you put it back together again. And it's not just a house. The, the, I'm a young pastor, just five years, and I'm trying to lead this church and how they put their lives back together again. And I started to study the book of Nehemiah because I knew he'd had to put a wall back together again. I thought maybe there's some lessons there. And uh, those lessons I taught them and myself at the same time were invaluable. And I've learned in the years since that it's not just a, a house you have to put back together again. The same, the same truths from Nehemiah fit if you're trying to put a relationship together again or a business together again or a life back together again. So we're going to share about this for the next few minutes. I, I can't possibly pack all that I've thought about this the last 30 years, or I've been writing on this for two and a half years into one message. But I think I can give us an overview that can give you some hope. Because we can't do it all in one message, uh, Shondell and I want, really want you to be able to study this in your small groups. Because we know if you study it for seven weeks together and talk about it, some real change can happen. So we have bought books so that our small groups can study this. 
and they're available for you on the patio afterwards. Unfortunately, more groups are taking advantage of this than we thought. So if when you go out, you can make sure you just take the number you need for each couple in your group and leave as many as you can for other people, that would be a great thing. But really the heart behind it is that you study this together so that God can talk to you together about how you can put it together again. I wanna give you a start on this. Where does this begin? And I think the starting place, before we say anything else, is to say that putting it together again does not mean it's gonna look just like it was. It's never gonna be just like it was. It's not rewinding and pretending it never happened. When we had to put our house together again, it still took all the time and energy, and there's still some things that were messed up, but our house was put together again. And when you put anything together again, you have to realize this is not a matter of pretending it didn't happen, the thing that fell apart. This is a matter of going on from there to realize God has something new to do. God has something fresh to do in your life. It means when you put a relationship together again, sometimes it means that the other person will say, no, I don't want to put it together again. Even in that circumstance, God can put you together again. He wants to do some things in your life. So wherever you are in this, God wants to do some work. But you have to start with where it starts. So let's start there. How do you start? And I gotta say, I have a heart for this, I think, more than anything in this process of rebuilding or putting it together again in our lives. It is this place that you start. Because I know so many times I've talked to people who things have fallen apart in their lives and they know they maybe need to restart. Maybe it's a, a relationship, a marriage that's fallen apart. And you're, you're still together, but you're not talking anymore. And it's been falling apart for years. And you've tried this and you've, you've tried that. And here comes a guy like me saying, hey, why don't you try again? And you're thinking in your mind, I'd like to. I just don't have it in me. I mean, I'm just worn out. I, I can't put it. I, I know I should. I know it's a great idea. I know other people have. I just don't have the emotional or spiritual strength or energy to do it right now. So where do you start when you feel that way? Because that's how most of us feel. When something has fallen apart, it wears you out physically and emotionally. Where do you start in order to begin to get the strength to rebuild? Nehemiah surprised me on this one. When I started reading what he did, the first thing that he did was not the first thing that I expected him to do. I expected him to dry, dive right in and get going. That's not where he started. Most important lesson I learned from Nehemiah is in the next verse in your outline. Nehemiah chapter one, verses three and four. They said to me, the wall of Jerusalem has been torn down and the gates have been destroyed by fire. When I heard this, I sat down and wept. In fact, for days, I mourned and I fasted and I prayed to the God of heaven. So that's where you start. When you don't have the strength to start, you do those three things. You mourn, you fast, and you pray. Because out of that, God can give the strength to begin. Let's take a closer look at each of those. First, mourning. Mourning is expressing your hurt to God. It's just taking the time to say, God, this hurts. God, this is tearing me apart inside. This is... Listen to why this is so important. Unless you mourn what you've lost, you cannot look to the future because you'll get stuck in your hurt. That's all you'll be able to see. Unless you mourn what you've lost, you cannot look to the future because you'll get caught up in only your hurt. That's why it's so important to mourn. It's also important to mourn because if you don't mourn, you can't get God's comfort and you need God's comfort and God's strength. Jesus taught us this. Jesus taught us in Matthew 5, 4, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. You want comfort from God? You gotta take the time to mourn. Now, there's a lot I could say about this. Maybe the most important thing I can say about this is I'm the last person to be talking to you about this because I'm not very good at mourning. A lot of reasons, but two of them are I'm American and I'm a man. Those are two big reasons why I'm not very good at mourning. Our culture is not good at mourning, and I particularly know I'm not very good at this. I've had to learn a lot about it. I got a lot more to learn. So we need some models for mourning, and I'm not it, but I'll tell you where you can find them. You can find them throughout the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, there are these models for how to mourn that surprise us, that are different than we would do it. There are godly ways to mourn, all the way from Abraham mourning the death of his wife Sarah, all the way to Mordecai mourning the loss potentially of an entire nation, all through the Old Testament. And when you read them and how they mourn, you find out they mourn different than we do. When, when I mourn, I wanna mourn too fast and too clean. What I really wanna do is just get back to work until the feeling goes away, right? But the feeling doesn't go away. 
When you read the Old Testament, they took time to mourn. It was days, it was weeks, it was months, it was often years. It takes time to mourn. And also, it wasn't pretty when they mourned. I mean, they let everybody know how they felt. A lot of us, when we mourn, it's just internal. Nobody else can know about it. We, we think that's strong. We think that is spiritual, but it's not. The truth of the matter is, the models of the Old Testament teach us, let other people know what you're going through. No, it, it's not pretty, but it is healing. Unless you mourn what you've lost, you're not gonna be able to see past your hurt. So that's where you start. You mourn. Second thing you do that Nehemiah teaches us is you fast. I mourned and I fasted. Mourning is expressing your hurt to God. Fasting is focusing your heart on God. You start to focus your heart on him. You give time to focus your heart. Now, let me just say at the beginning, it may not be a food fast that you do. A lot of you, you eat fast food, so you don't need a food fast. You need something different. You need something for time in your life. In fact, for many of us, we, re- we need an entertainment fast. Because that's taking a chunk of our time that could be given instead to just thinking, focusing on God. Some of us just need to turn off the radio or the podcast in the car for a couple of weeks and just use that time just to let God speak to you. God can speak in the quietness. God can speak in that time of focus. It's making space to sense that God is with you. That's what happens in a fast. It's making space to focus your heart on God. Joel 2.12 talks about it and says, Turn to me with all your heart, God says, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. When you take the time to do that, and it does take time, when you take the time to do that, God will often first meet you there, comfort you there, strengthen you there, but then out of that time, he will begin to give you a direction. You can't force it, it doesn't happen as quickly as you want, but he begins to give the next step that you're gonna take, and that's how you begin. You mourn and you fast. In the early church, they were fasting one day and they got some direction. Acts 13, verse two. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them to. Saul is later named Paul. Barnabas and Saul, their missionary journeys changed the world, absolutely changed the world. And out of this time of fasting, God will often give a direction that will change the direct the the direction, the trajectory of your life. That's the power of taking some time to focus on God. So God giving you some direction, then you need to do the third thing, and that is praying. Praying is asking for help from God. Saying, God, I'm not gonna do this on my own. You've given me direction. I'm not gonna run off on my own now and do this. I need your strength. The most powerful one-word prayer, I believe, is the word help. That is a powerful prayer. Because it expresses, I can't do this on my own. God, I need your strength. It's all through the Bible. Psalm 28, verse one is one of the places. Lord, my rock, I call out to you for help. When our home and church were destroyed and I'm having to figure out how do I lead my family, how do I, how do I lead this church, I had a choice to make. Was I gonna lean on my strength or was I gonna lean on God's strength? Now I know as a pastor, I, I talk about leaning on God's strength But talking about it and doing it are two different things. Whose strength was I gonna really lean on? Was I gonna lean on God's strength enough to ask for his help and also ask for other people's help? Was I gonna lean on God's strength enough to admit my weaknesses and where I needed God's help and other people's help? That's leaning on God's strength. Was I gonna do that? I had, uh, like just a couple weeks before this flood, I talked in a sermon about a guy named Gordon Bushnell, and, and it came back to me as I was struggling with this. This, this was a guy who many years ago decided that there needed to be a highway, 200 mile highway between Fargo and Duluth and the government wouldn't build it. So he decided, I'm gonna build it myself. So he goes out and with just a number two shovel and a wheelbarrow and an old John Deere tractor, he starts to build this highway. So when I saw the news story on him, he'd been working on this for 20 years and he'd built nine miles of the highway. Only 191 to go. And he's like 70 years old. I don't think he's gonna make it, right? And there's something in us that wants to say, I wanna be that kind of guy. I mean, he did it. Nobody else would do it. He did it all by himself. But I wanna remind you that all by himself, all he got was nine miles. He didn't finish all that could have been done through his life because he did it all by himself. God wants to do such great things in your life. 
I don't know, some of you, you look at your life and you go, I have built my nine miles. And you're pretty proud of that nine miles. And it's a good nine miles. But I'm, I'm telling you, with God's help, with God's strength, you can't imagine what he wants to do in your life. You can't imagine what he wants to rebuild in your life. That's what happens with the power of God. There's a prayer I pray for myself. I pray for you. It's the next verse in your outline, Ephesians 1.19. I pray that you will begin to understand I pray that you will begin to understand how incredibly great his power is to help those who believe him. He's got power for your life. He's got help for your life that you cannot imagine. So that's how you start. You mourn, you you fast, you pray. Out of that, you begin to get some direction and you get started in that direction. And then you hit the next place. If you're gonna rebuild, you gotta figure out how am I gonna keep going? How am I going to keep going in this? Because any rebuilding, a, a relationship or, or a house or a business, whatever it is, it's a project. It's a big project. It's going to take a lot of time. And you're going to need energy. You're going to need strength to make it through. Where do you find the energy to keep going? Well, there's a lot of places you find energy to keep going in life. But as I was walking through what Nehemiah did to keep energy, I, I found a couple surprises. There's a couple surprising places that you can keep energy going as you're rebuilding. Let me share with you a couple things Nehemiah teaches us. Number one, you take time to say thank you. You wanna keep energy up in life? You take time to say thank you because great energy flows into your life when you encourage, when you say thank you to other people. Great energy flows into your life when you say thank you to God. The Apostle Paul, who had a lot of energy, really changed the world, he was very, very fond of saying thank you. It was one of the habits of his life. Romans 1.8, he writes to the, book, the church in Rome and he says, first, I, I wanna say that I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because people everywhere in the world are talking about your faith. So at first, I gotta say, that's true of you, Saddleback Church. People everywhere in the world are talking about your faith. Those of you who have gone around the world know this. If you haven't, when you go around the world, you see other churches, they talk about Saddleback Church. And they talk about your changed lives. And they talk about you trusting God to do things that no one else could do. They talk about the fact that you've become unselfish and you care about the community. You care about the world. They're talking about your faith. When you see that happening, you, you, you thank God for that. And then you thank the person for that. Paul does this again with the Ephesians. In Ephesians 1.16, he says, I couldn't stop thanking God for you. Every time I prayed, I'd think of you and I would give thanks. So notice what Paul's doing here. He is telling them that he thanked God for them and in that, he's also thanking them. The thanks goes both to them and to God at the same time. That's not a bad way to do it. Yes, you should thank God for other people in prayer, but why not tell them? You think, well, they'll get prideful. They need the encouragement, let me just tell you. Why not tell them that you are thankful for them? So who do you need to write a note of thanks to right now? Who do you need to write a text of thanks to right now? And you wanna know what really gives great energy? What really is a game changer on this one? When you are feeling unappreciated, when you feel like nobody's thanking me, and some of you are feeling that way right now, when you feel that way, you think, well, if I'm feeling like nobody appreciates me, guess what? There's probably somebody else who's feeling like nobody's appreciating them. And I'm, instead of having a pity party, which is easy to do when you're feeling un underappreciated, instead of that, I'm gonna find somebody else to thank. I've done this many, 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 many times in my life. That's because I felt unappreciated many times. Haven't we all? I mean, what's wrong with us? We don't get a sense of appreciation every single minute. Sometimes we feel like, how come they didn't thank me? That's just our human pride. We're gonna feel that way sometimes. So when you feel that way, you find somebody else to appreciate. And when you appreciate them, God's gonna pour new energy into your life. You lift somebody else up. So you choose to appreciate. You choose to say thank you. And then you do a second thing. You choose to celebrate. Choose to celebrate God and who he is. Choose to celebrate all that God's put into your life. We, we get this idea sometimes that we're gonna rebuild something. We're gonna put something together again 
And we get so intense about it that we think, I'm gonna celebrate when the project's done. And I'm saying to you, celebrate all the way along the way, because you need the energy all the way along the way. Don't wait till it's done to celebrate. Celebrate every day. Because in some ways, spiritually, we're like a battery that's being drained. And some of you, you're energizer bunnies. I know, you can keep on going and going and going. But even you, you're gonna run out of energy. It might take a year, but you're gonna run out of energy. Celebration, celebrating God and who he is and celebrating all the things he's put into our lives, that's what gives you the strength and energy to keep on going on. We celebrate lots of things, and we should. Everything that God's made, everything that we enjoy in life, we should celebrate. But one of the things to remember is that at the center of all celebration is worship. Because everything you celebrate, if you're celebrating your family, God made your family. Celebrating your health, God gave you your health. Celebrating some victory at work, God gave you the idea, God gave you the strength to do that. So at the center of all celebration is worship. The Bible says in Psalm 106 verse one, we will celebrate and praise you, Lord. You are good to us. Your love never fails. I love those phrases, you are good to us. Your love never fails. You can celebrate that no matter what. I don't care what you face this week, those are things that you can celebrate. Probably the most familiar verse in the book of Nehemiah is about celebration. Have you heard this verse? Nehemiah chapter eight, verse 10 says, the joy of the Lord is your strength. That one's worth reading together. Would you read it with me? The joy of the Lord is your strength. You want the strength you need to keep going? Joy is your strength. Joy gives strength. Now, I want you to notice really carefully, it's the joy of the Lord that gives you strength. It's not the joy of you that gives you strength. So this is not you trying to manufacture joy somehow. I've got to have more joy so I can have more strength. No, this is you receiving his gift of joy. The gift of the fact that he loves you no matter what. The gift of the fact that he wants to pour his grace on you. The gift of the fact that he has a purpose and plan for you. You receive the gift of his joy, and that's where the strength comes from. Look at this next verse. It's a verse about how they celebrated in the days of Nehemiah when they were rebuilding this wall. Nehemiah 8, 12 says, So the people went away to eat and drink at a festive meal, to share gifts of food, and to celebrate with great joy because it was Super Bowl Sunday. No, no, that's not what it says. Sorry, sorry because they had heard God's words and understood them. Now I'm saying we should celebrate Super Bowl Sunday. We should also celebrate hearing God's words and understanding them. Pastor Buddy talked about this last week, that when you hear God's word and it makes a difference in your life, that is always worth celebrating. We should celebrate everything. You should celebrate at a ball game. You should celebrate at a baptism. Everything should be celebrated. But I've noticed something, and you've probably noticed this too. We tend to reserve our biggest celebrations sometimes for the smallest things and our smallest celebrations for the biggest things. So yeah, we should celebrate at at a ball game. Somebody makes a great catch. (laughs) That was awesome. But we talk about that for days, right? Somebody's baptized. Oh, that was cool. And then we just walk away and sort of forget it. Why don't we celebrate that just as much? Because the baptism, that changed life is gonna last longer than that great catch. No doubt about it. So Day after the ball game, somebody made a great catch. You're standing talking to some people at work. Did you see the game yesterday? It was awesome. The the catch that guy made, I'll never forget. It was unbelievable. The day after the baptism, why don't we do that? You're standing with some friends at work and you say, did you see that baptism yesterday? It was awesome. I, I just couldn't believe it. God could change that guy's life. I couldn't believe that he could do it. I'll never forget it. Why don't we celebrate the big things more? The things that are really gonna last. Celebrate it all, because out of this celebration comes the strength that we need to keep on keeping on. Out of appreciation, out of celebration. Now, one last thing to talk about, and that is, how does it last? I know a lot of people who've done the hard work to rebuild a relationship, only to see it fall apart again just a few years later. What happened? Why didn't it last? Or I know people who've rebuilt a business, Put, they're all into it, and then all of a sudden it falls apart again. Or people who've rebuilt a faith, they, they've rebuilt to the point of trusting God in a new way, building new habits into their life, but they run into a wall, and all of a sudden their lives are apart from the Lord again. What in the world happens that it doesn't last? Write this down with me. For anything to last, it must be dedicated to God. 
For something to last, it must be dedicated to God. I'm talking about things lasting, really lasting through this life and lasting all the way into eternity. And the key is dedication. Now, dedication is not determination. Determination is how you do it, the focus, the energy that you do it with. Dedication is who you do it for. It's dedicated to God. We're gonna be watching a lot of us, the Olympics, over these next couple of weeks. And we're gonna see a lot of determined athletes. They're all determined. You can't make it to the Olympics without being determined to get there. But those athletes, they're all dedicated to different things. Some of them are dedicated to the team. Some of them are dedicated to themselves. Some of them are dedicated to the money they might be able to make after the Olympics. Some of them are dedicated to their family. Some of them are dedicated to God. They're dedicated to different things. Those who have dedicated it to God, what God does in their lives at the Olympics, it's gonna last in ways that it's not gonna last for anybody else. Paul actually talks about this in the Bible. They had the Olympics back then, and he talks about this. It's the next verse in your outline, 1 Corinthians 9, 25. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. So dedication is why you do what you do. If you do it for yourself, then you're dedicated to yourself. If you do it for God, you're dedicated to God. And the reason things often don't last is we did it for ourselves. We didn't dedicate it to God. I rebuilt this marriage because of my pride and I had to prove I could do it. Or because of my hurt and I wanted to get away from that hurt. But we really didn't dedicate it to God. So how do you do this? How do you dedicate it to God? It's, it's almost as if you have this, this ceremony in your mind where you bring whatever it is in your life that you want to last and you say, God, here it is, open hands. I, I'm dedicating it to you. You might want to do that right now, maybe with your marriage. Maybe you've done that a hundred times. Maybe you've never done that. But right now in your mind, God, I dedicate my marriage to you. It's for you, not for me. It, it's for your glory. It's to show the world what your love is like. It's to show the world how you can work in two sinful people to, to, to cause us to somehow come together and be able to get along with each other. And not only that, maybe make a difference in this world with each other. I, I dedicate it to you. I rededicate it to you. Maybe it's your family. I dedicate it to you. Maybe it's your business. Have you ever done that? Have you ever said, God, I dedicate my business to you? It's, it's yours. It's not mine. It changes everything. You're living with open hands before him rather than closed hands. God, I, I dedicate myself to you. I dedicate my heart to you. Look at what we learn from the book of Nehemiah as they dedicated the wall after they had built it. The Bible says in Nehemiah 12, 30, the priests and the Levites first dedicated themselves and then the people, the gates and the wall. That's an important lesson. If I'm gonna dedicate anything to God, I gotta first dedicate myself to God. That's where it begins. So have you ever done that? If you haven't, you can right now. You can say, Jesus Christ, I, I dedicate my life to you. I dedicate myself to you. I give my heart and life to you. Now, here's the good news. You don't have to become a perfect person to dedicate yourself to him. He offered himself for you. He gave himself on the cross so that you can dedicate your life back to him. He gave himself to you so that you can give in dedication your life back to him. He's already given the gift, so right now you just say, Jesus Christ, I give my heart, I give my life back to you. That's something you do at the beginning, and then that's something you do as a follower of Jesus Christ every day of your life. Romans 12.1 is probably the strongest verse about this in all the Bible. It says, so then, my friends, because of God's great mercy to us, I appeal to you. Offer yourselves as a living sacrifice to God, dedicated to his service and pleasing to him. This is the true worship that you should offer. I gotta do that every day because my dedication happens to leak out the back door of my heart sometimes, and maybe yours too. So it's a daily dedication. I dedicate it to you, God. Now, hold on to that outline because I got something I want you to write on the bottom in just a minute. As we come to the end of this, I wanna just take a look at an honest question, and that is, why rebuild it all? I mean, why not just give up and, and start over? Wouldn't it be easier? The reason you rebuild, the reason you put it together again is because of the value of what you're rebuilding. As I was writing this book, I did some study on the Sistine Chapel. I wanted to study the great art restoration projects in history, and the Sistine Chapel is probably one of the greatest that was done. 
And so I, I studied how long did it take originally to paint and then how long did it take to restore? The, the painting, Michelangelo and a few others, they didn't do it all at once, but in the times that they did it, it was about 12 years to paint the Sistine Chapel. When you take a look at how long it took to restore, it took 14 years to restore. So it took longer to rebuild than to paint it in the first place. So why not just take some white paint and just paint over the Sistine Chapel and just paint something new? Wouldn't it take less time? The reason you don't do that is because the Sistine Chapel is invaluable. You can't reproduce it. You can't remake it. It's priceless. So why do you rebuild? Why do you put it together again? Because you're more priceless to God than a Sistine Chapel. Your marriage is more priceless to God than a Sistine Chapel. What God wants to do in your life as you build your business, that is more priceless to God than anything on this earth. That's why we rebuild, because of the value of what God has put into our lives and what he wants to do in our lives. Let me just say, I know as we talk about rebuilding, that there's some things, some realities we gotta face. I know if you think about rebuilding a relationship, maybe it's with one of your kids, maybe it's in a marriage, I know that the other person might reject you if you say I wanna rebuild. I know they may say no, but I also know, having been a pastor for decades, I also know how many marriages, how many relationships have just slipped into silence and nothingness just because no one had the courage to say, could we rebuild this? I know how many marriage, marriages could be saved if just one person had the faith, the courage to say, could we work to rebuild this? And yeah, it takes faith. Yeah, it takes courage, but God wants to work. I also know even if that other person says no, God's gonna do some things in your life because of your willingness to begin again that's gonna bless some other people's lives, that's gonna help some other people's lives. I, I know that the business you wanna rebuild, that the ministry you wanna rebuild, it's not gonna look just like it looked before. But I also know God's got something he wants to do as you rebuild that's gonna bless not only your business, but also bless the world with what God's done in your heart and your life. Shondell and I, it might have been easier for us to just leave that destroyed house. And it was a small church. Maybe they could find another pastor. We could have just gone to another community and found another church and begun to pastor there. I'm so glad we didn't. I'm so glad we took the time to put it together again because we're different people than we would have been. God built our hearts, our faith. I'm a different man than I would have been. God taught me some things about leadership and about family and about ministry and about faith that I would have never learned in my life. The truth of the matter is, if you're gonna put it together again, if you're gonna take that step in life, there's something you're gonna have to face. Let's just be honest about it. You're gonna have to face your fear. Because it's scary to step out and even begin to dream again. You've let go of the dream. You're, you're satisfied with a no dream life. I'll just be a no dream person. No, God can't do this. Or even if he could do this, I'm not going to put myself there. I don't want to go through that again. And even me just talking about this, it's scary for you. I understand that. I understand that. But I want you to know something. In fact, would you write this on the bottom of your outline? God has the answer for all my fears. God has the answer for all my fears. He knows your fears. He knows what you're gonna face. He knows what's gonna happen. And before it happens, he has the answer. He's gonna meet you there. When you step out in faith, despite your fear, God can do some amazing things. Now, I'm not a prophet. I don't have a crystal ball. I cannot promise you what will happen as you start to rebuild. But I can promise you that nothing will happen unless someone takes a step of faith to say, let's rebuild. I can promise you that God will meet you there. And even though I don't know what will happen, something will happen that will bring glory to him and that will bring into your heart a sense of God's doing something that only he could do. I want that in my life. I want that in your life. I have a feeling that right now, some of you, there's a step of faith that you need to take in your life. So let's pray about it. Let's talk to him about it. Would you pray with me? And let me just first say, some of you, you're not at the step of faith step yet. You just need to start. You don't have any energy. You don't even know if you can rebuild. Well, just start with mourning and fasting and praying. Just come to God right now and say, God, it hurts. He'll hear you. Just start there. Some of you, you're at the place where you need to step out in faith. 
Ask God for strength to do what you can't do on your own, to have that conversation, to take that first step, to make that first decision, to trust him. And for all of us, we need to dedicate it to God. So right now, just in your mind, have that dedication ceremony again and say, God, I'm bringing myself to you. I dedicate my life to you. And then I'm bringing all the other stuff, whatever first comes to your mind, whether it's family or, or business or dreams or future. God, I dedicate it to you because you're worthy. You're worthy of all my dedication. You're where it's all going. You're where it's all headed. You're what it's all about. So I'm, I celebrate that I can dedicate it to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks for checking out this message on YouTube. My name is Jay and I'm Saddleback's online campus pastor and I would love to invite you to join our online community. Here are three ways you can take a next step. First, learn more about belonging to our church family by completing Class 101 online. Second, don't do life alone anymore by getting into an online only small group that meets on platforms like Skype or learn more about hosting a group with your friends in your home. Third, join our global Facebook community to connect with others with the online community and be more engaged in the day to day. To take any of those next steps, visit saddleback.com online or email online at saddleback.com. Hope to hear from you soon.